Introduction to the Elements of Anatomy and Physiology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rushenberger. Introduction. Natural history, which may be defined the intelligent contemplation of the works of God, is in a manner the most certain and the most noble subject that can occupy the mind of man. In it alone human genius is in full possession of certainty. Philosophy, politics, history, and morality itself are subject to the intellectual revolutions of wavering humanity. But the facts of the creation are as invariable as God, and the analysis obtained from a plant or an insect marks its demonstration with the seal of eternal truth. The double effect of the study of natural history is to impart certainty to the mind and religion to the heart. The creation is as a visible ladder by which man ascends towards the invisible creator. Natural history, the science which is the mother of all sciences, embraces the whole world physical knowledge, mathematical knowledge, are all comprehended in its domain. And as we have just said, the teachings of morality here mingle of themselves without any effort with thoughts of religion. It has been said that natural history should be the only reading book of the people. I would add it should be the first book of childhood, of all the means which we may successfully employ for awakening the intellect of young people there is none the results of which are more certain or more durable than curiosity the desire to know is as natural as reason it is vivid and active at every period of life but it is never more so than in youth when the mind destitute of knowledge seizes upon all that presents itself with avidity and willingly gives the attention and study necessary to know and very naturally contracts the habit of reflection and of being occupied it is not the labors of the learned that are to be brought to the attention of infancy, but a study of nature, to comprehend which requires scarcely anything but eyes, and which consists in examining carefully the objects of nature, in order to admire their beauties, without diving into their hidden causes. Children are capable of this study, for they have eyes, and they have curiosity. They desire to know, and they are inquiring. A garden, a field, a palace, all is an open book for them, and they should be taught to read in it. It is inconceivable, says Rowland, how much children might learn if we could profit by the opportunities which they themselves afford us. To seize upon these opportunities should be a desideratum with instructors and parents. In this, then, behold what nature was without man. But if man appear, if to recur to the brilliant thought of Bacon, man is added to nature then creation has a voice a value a sense of the innumerable crowds of animals and of plants that share between them the domain of the earth and of the marvellous events that renew the face of things man has become the master and the historian all have an equal right to his admiration all are equally subjects of his study from the almost imperceptible mould to the colossal productions of the vegetable kingdom from the microscopic animalcule to the elephant and the whale, from the atom of sand to the summit of Atlas he interrogates, he comprehends, he explains them all. Imagination is no longer at the expense of inventing brilliant pictures. Truth alone strikes his mind and elevates his soul, and in place of the confused reveries inspired by chaos appears a science of wisdom, of reason, and of order, which, in a word, is natural history the individual who enters a field or strolls upon the bank of a stream or roams through the forest if he comprehend the elements of natural history may read a pleasant story and acquire information at every step from the great book of nature which everywhere lies open wide before him but if ignorant of natural history this magnificent and varied work is to him no more than is a printed volume to one who never learned a letter natural history not only affords us the means of endless amusement but teaches us to discover the riches of the earth and to gather from them the means 
of ameliorating and improving the condition of man. End of introduction. Lesson 1 of The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Latham. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rushenberger. Lesson 1. General Notions on Natural History. Lesson 1. The Natural Sciences and Their Divisions. Definition of Zoology. General Knowledge Necessary to Its Successful Study. The Structure of Animals and Enumeration of Their Principal Organs. Classification of the Functions of Animals. The natural sciences have for their object the study of those beings, the assemblage of which compose the universe. This study is divided into many distinct branches, but these branches are all so linked one to another as to afford a mutual support. The different branches of the natural sciences are physics, chemistry, astronomy, meteorology, and natural history. The name physics is given to that science which embraces the consideration of the general properties of matter, which studies the motions of bodies as well as heat, light, electricity, and attraction, and which applies the knowledge thus acquired to the explanation of the great phenomena of nature. Chemistry has for its object the knowledge of the intimate composition of bodies, and the various combinations which may be made from them. It teaches us what are the forming elements of different bodies, and how these elements, by combining in various ways, may give rise to other bodies, and enables us to understand the properties of all these substances. Natural history, taken in its most general acceptation, should include the study of the form, of the structure, and of the mode of existence of all the bodies of nature, individually considered. But, by common consent, the domain of this science is more limited, and all that has not a direct relation to the physical history of our globe and the beings spread over its surface is excluded. Consequently, it does not embrace the study of the stars, nor the meteors, nor even the air which surrounds our globe, or, in other words, it comprises neither astronomy nor meteorology. Astronomy, if we may so express ourselves, is the natural history of the celestial bodies. By the assistance of observation and calculation, it applies the general laws of physics to the study of the phenomena which the celestial bodies present, and thus determines their form, their volume, the distance which they are separated from our globe as well as from each other, and the movements which they perform in space. Meteorology is in some measure the natural history of the atmosphere. It inquires the origin of thunder, of rain, of hail, of the dew, and falling of meteoric stones, aerolites, and of the various meteors which appear in the heavens. Natural history, properly so called, we repeat, extends its domain over the structure of our globe and over all of the beings found upon its surface. These beings are separated into three groups or kingdoms, the mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, and the animal kingdom. In this way, natural history is divided into three branches. The natural history of minerals, and that of the terrestrial globe, which is formed of them, bears the name mineralogy or geology. The natural history of plants is called botany. The natural history of animals is termed zoology. It is the last of these which is to occupy our attention at present. The study of animals, as well as the study of plants, is subdivided into three principal branches, according as they are considered in respect to, first, the characteristics which distinguish them from one another, the climate they dwell in, their habits, and, second, 
the internal structures of their bodies third the play of their organs and the manner in which they respectively produce the various phenomena of life these three branches of natural history of animals and of plants constitute three sciences which are known under names of zoology or when plants are referred to descriptive botany anatomy and physiology anatomy treats of the internal conformation of living beings it studies them by the aid of dissection and acquaints us with the position the form and the structure of their organs inasmuch as it embraces the consideration of either animals or plants it constitutes two distinct sciences zoological anatomy and vegetable anatomy physiology is the science of life it teaches the use of different organs and in the manner in which these act to produce the different phenomena that is visible qualities proper to living beings like anatomy it may have for its domain either the animal or vegetable kingdom and it is consequently divided into animal physiology and vegetable physiology it is easy to understand that without the aid of anatomy and physiology the profound study of natural history would be impossible when we wish to obtain an exact idea of a watch we do not limit ourselves to observing its exterior form and to noticing the manner in which the hands turn we open it we examine every wheel every chain every spring we would separate them one by one and study the relations which they have to each other and we would seek to understand their use afterwards we should again put together all the pieces and by re-establishing their mutual relations restore what we had taken from them that is their movements and their play now what the watchmaker does to obtain exact knowledge of a watch the naturalist does as far as he is capable to study an animal or plant by dissection he examines the interior of its body separates the different organs determines their relations and studies their form and nature then he observes their play during life and by making experiments becomes acquainted with their uses unfortunately the naturalist cannot do all the watchmaker does he can destroy but he cannot reconstruct what he has deranged and restore movement to organs which he has separated to study their structure nevertheless by anatomical investigation observation of the vital phenomenon and by physiological experiments he ascertains the mechanism of these complicated machines and succeeds in satisfying ardent curiosity which is one of the characteristic traits of superior intelligence no study can be more grand or more interesting in revealing what is extraordinary in animal organization it leaves us filled with admiration at the sight of this infinite this most astonishing work of the creator considered in their mechanical relation alone the bodies of the animals present us examples of complication and perfection to which our best constructed and most perfect machines do not approach here we find without number models of ingenious contrivances of which the most successful labors of the architect or optician have produced but imperfect copies but these are the least of the wonders which the animal economy offers us the forces which put into action all the material springs of our body are regulated and combined with the wisdom which is far beyond human science and the more we contemplate the play of our organs and the faculties with which they are endowed the more we feel the necessity of recurring to the superior intelligence who has created this admirable production and who has placed in it a principle of existence and of movement to study with profit the particular history of different animals it is necessary as we see to possess some general notions of their anatomy and physiology and it is this preliminary knowledge which is to engage our attention in the first of our course 
of the general composition of animal bodies and the functions performed by their different organs all living beings are formed of the union of solid and of liquid parts the solid parts are composed of small fibers and little plates so arranged as to contain the liquid parts in spaces left between them they thus form textures or tissues of various kinds and we give the name of organization to the disposition which these tissues assume organized bodies that is bodies having an organization or mode of structure which we have just indicated are the only living beings because their internal conformation is necessary to the maintenance of life therefore non-organized or inorganic bodies as stones and metals are incapable of living the different phenomena by which life manifests itself are always the result of the action of some part of the living body and these parts which may be regarded as so many instruments are called organs thus an animal cannot move without the action of certain organs called muscles or attain a knowledge of that which surrounds him except by the intervention of the organs of sense when several organs concur to produce the same phenomenon the assemblage of instruments is termed an apparatus we say for example the apparatus of locomotion to designate the assemblage of organs which serve to transfer an animal from one place to another and the apparatus of digestion to designate the assemblage of organs by the assistance of which the animals digest its food the action of one of these organs or of one of these apparatus or the use of which they are designed is called a function we say therefore function of locomotion to designate the action of all of the parts of the apparatus of locomotion the function of digestion to designate the action of the different parts which constitute the digestive apparatus and functions of the stomach functions of the intestines functions of the teeth and etc to designate the uses of these different organs with man as well as with all quadrupeds birds and a majority of other animals the organs and the functions which the latter exercise are very various considered individually the body of the majority of animals is divided into three principal portions the head the trunk and the members or extremities the head which is not found with all animals oysters for instance is subdivided into two parts the cranium or skull and the face the trunk is composed also of two parts the chest or thorax and the belly or abdomen in most of the animals at present referred to the members exist in double pairs and are distinguished as superior or thoracic and posterior or abdominal or inferior members or extremities certain animals such as the whale have only a single pair others such as serpents have none at all and others again have a considerable number insects have three pairs of feet spiders four pairs crabs and lobsters five pairs the wood louse or palmer seven pairs and certain worms have as many as five hundred pairs in all of these animals the body is enveloped on all sides in a resisting membrane endowed with sensibility which is termed the skin it is secured from the inside and its general form is determined by the solid frame composed of a number of bones called a skeleton frontispiece farther on we shall enumerate these bones speak of their names in various forms the skeleton does not exist with all animals oysters and snails for example are without it and with others again such as lobsters the skin acquires an extreme hardness and answers in place of the bony frame but with all mammiferous animals birds 
reptiles and fishes there exists a skeleton arranged in a manner analogous to that of man between this internal frame and the skin or external envelope are found the muscles which constitute what is commonly called flesh whose function is to produce by their contractions all the motions which the animal performs between these muscles are placed the vessels which carry the blood to different points in the body and the nerves which give sensibility within the head and in the trunk we find also other parts the face presents several cavities which serve to lodge the organs of sight of smell and of taste the cranium or skull is a sort of bony box the interior of which is filled by one of the most important organs of the body the brain which is continued downward in a thick whitish cord called the spinal marrow it descends along the neck and communicates with the principal nerves of the body on cutting through the ribs and opening the bony cage which anatomists call the thorax and which we commonly call the chest or breast we find the heart and lungs a fleshy partition the diaphragm separates the chest from the belly or abdomen and in this latter cavity are contained the stomach the intestines the liver the spleen and many other organs of less importance these different organs fulfill very various functions some such as the mouth the teeth the stomach the intestines and the liver serve digestion others such as the lungs are designed for respiration others again the heart for example distribute to all the organs matter necessary for their nourishment and there are others again the use of which is to enable us to appreciate tastes and smells to hear sounds to see what surrounds us to feel what touches us and to transport us from place to place these functions in spite of their diversity tend to two principal objects and are consequently divided into two classes the object of one class of functions is the preservation of life of the individual and are therefore denominated functions of nutrition the others place the animal in relation with all that surrounds him and consequently are called functions of relation the functions of nutrition as their name implies all serve in imparting nutrition to the animal either by separating nutritive matter from the productions of the earth by modifying the matter and by reducing it to a fluid or juice fit to be admitted into the organs or finally by conveying into the substance or the organs this nourishing fluid which by its combinations ensures their maintenance and favors their growth consequently digestion respiration and the circulation of the blood belong to this class of functions the functions of relation are all those which place the animal in relation with the other beings of nature they are principally the faculties of feeling in different ways and of moving by the aid of these functions the animal is enabled to appreciate the form the color and the position of objects surrounding him to hear the sounds which they make to advance towards or retire from them in a word they serve to establish between him and the external world a variety of relations which are as numerous as they are useful the functions of nutrition are indispensable to the maintenance of life and they are found in greater or less number in all living or organized beings and for this reason they are called the functions of organic life or functions of vegetative life the functions of relation on the contrary do not exist in all living beings plants have them not animals alone possess them but in losing them they do not necessarily cease to live during a part of their existence they do not exercise them and this state of repose or the functions of relation constitutes sleep in consequence of these functions 
being peculiar to animals, they are also called the functions of animal life. It is now very easy to state, in a few words, the most important differences which exist between vegetables and animals. Vegetables are being constituted for living with the power of nourishing and reproducing themselves. Animals are beings which conformation enables them to live, to be nourished, to reproduce themselves, to feel, and to move. The reader will now easily comprehend the differences between organized beings, as plant and animals, and inorganic bodies, as rocks and minerals, which do not possess the power of nourishing and reproducing themselves. The first and most important effects of living organization, for without these effects, death would speedily leave the earth destitute of both animals and plants. We shall first consider those functions which belong to the vegetative life, and which have nutrition for their object. End Lesson 1Lesson 2 of the Elements of Anatomy and Physiology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Ruschenberger. Lesson 2 of the Functions of Nutrition of the Nutritive Act. Nutrition is the vital act by which the different parts of the bodies of organized beings renew the materials of which they are composed. To effect this renovation, the animal appropriates certain substances within his reach, which are adapted to this purpose, and these substances, being introduced into the body and distributed to the different organs, are there retained and become constituent parts of them. At the same time that the organs thus acquire new materials, they lose others which, having become old and useless, are in some way detached and expelled. Thus, then, the new materials take the place of those which have been detached from the organ, so that its substance is, little by little, renewed. When a living being thus incorporates with its organs more material than it loses, its volume augments and, of course, its weight increases. Thus, by the act of nutrition, the infant, which at birth weighed only five or six pounds, is found to have acquired, when it has reached the age of twenty-five years, more than a hundred weight, and a proportionate increase in size. But, if the contrary be true, and the living being loses more material than it incorporates with its organs, it grows thin, as is often observed when the adult approaches extreme age, and when these two phenomena are in just equilibrium, its weight remains the same. This nutritive act takes place in all living beings. Brute bodies, as stones and minerals, are not nourished. The materials of which these are composed remain the same as long as they exist and if their volume increase, it is simply by the juxtaposition of substances of the same nature as their own. But animals and plants, on the contrary, grow by intussusception, that is to say, by the deposit of new particles within their very substance. The continual process of composition and decomposition, which constitutes the nutritive act, is not perceptible to our senses but observations have been made which remove all doubt of its existence, even in the bones, the hardest and deepest seated parts of the body. An English surgeon, Belcher, eating of a pig which had been fed by a dyer, remarked that the bones of the animal were red, and, attributing this peculiarity to the colored substances which it had eaten, conceived an idea that analogous means might serve to render visible the effects of the nutritive act he made experiments which, repeated by a number of learned men, were crowned with entire success. After feeding animals on matter for a certain time, it is always found that the bones are stained red by a deposit of this coloring matter in their substance. And, after having thus fed an animal and then suspending the use of the matter, it is found, after a certain period, 
that the red matter which must have been deposited in the substance of these organs is no longer there but has been as we must conclude ejected now these facts may be explained by the continuous process of composition and decomposition to which is given the name of nutrition this renovation of the constituent materials of the body is indispensable to the continuance of life when it stops in an organ that organ decays and when it ceases throughout death soon follows the nutrition of organized bodies is affected by the aid of a liquid which conveys into all the organs the necessary materials for their sustenance and which serves at the same time to carry away from their substance those particles which are detached by the nutritive act and destined to be expelled from the body in plants this liquid is the sap and in animals it is the blood of the blood the blood is the nutritive liquid of animals it is this liquid which maintains life in the organs and furnishes them with the materials of which they are composed the blood is the source of all the humors formed in the body as the saliva tears bile etc in man and all animals resembling him in organization the blood is red in a great number of others it is colorless or of a slight yellow or lilac tint the animals which have red blood are the mammalia birds reptiles fishes and certain worms called the annelides the animals with white blood are the insects the arachnids that is spiders and other animals resembling them the crustacea a class of animals composed of crabs lobsters etc the mollusca or animals resembling snails and oysters and some others it is a vulgar error to suppose that flies have red blood in the head when one of these animals is crushed we see it is true an effusion of reddish liquid but this is not blood and comes from the eyes of these little beings whose blood like that of all insects is white blood is more or less thick and opaque when examined by a microscope we perceive that it is formed of two distinct parts namely first of a yellowish transparent liquid called serum second of a great number of solid particles of extremely small size which swim in the serum and which are called the globules of the blood to these globules the blood is indebted for its red color they are flattened and have a considerable resemblance to small pieces of money slightly drilled out in the middle their form and size vary in different animals in man the dog the horse and all other animals of the class of mammalia the globules of the blood are circular in birds reptiles and fishes the globules are of an oval form they are smallest in the mammalia and largest in reptiles and fishes the blood of the mammalia and birds contains the greatest number of globules in animals with white blood the globules are colorless generally circular and very few in number when these globules are carefully examined with a powerful microscope it is seen that each one is composed of two distinct parts and that they consist of a sort of bladder or a membranous sac in the middle of which there is found a spheroidal corpuscule a diminutive body under ordinary circumstances this bladder is flattened and forms around a central nucleus a circular border of greater or less depth so that as a whole it presents the appearance of a disc swelled or bulged in the middle the external envelope of the globules consists of a sort of jelly which is of a more or less beautiful red color and is easily divided it is to the presence of these vesicles little bladders that the blood owes its color the central nucleus of the globules is more consistent and is not colored in its ordinary state the blood is always fluid and the globules swim freely in the serum but when drawn from the vessels which contain it and left to itself it is not slow to congeal and to present the phenomenon of coagulation 
When blood coagulates, the globules unite themselves together in a mass and little by little separate from the serum to form a clot more or less solid. Chemistry teaches us that in man, 100 parts of blood contain about 66 parts of water, from six to seven hundredths of albumin, from fourteen to fifteen hundredths of fibrin and coloring matter, some thousandths of fatty matters of several salts and traces of peroxide of iron. Under ordinary circumstances, we cannot discover in the blood those substances which are found in the different humors formed at its expense. But if we arrest the action of those organs that are charged with secreting these humors, we then find in the blood the matters in question. We must therefore conclude that they always exist in it, but in quantities too small to be appreciated by our methods of analysis, and that the organs just alluded to do not form them, but separate them from the blood in proportion as they are presented. The blood contains all the materials necessary to the reparation and growth of the organs. Consequently, it furnishes to all parts the matter of which they are in need for their nourishment and also imparts the excitement necessary to the maintenance of life. To appreciate fully the importance of the office filled by the blood in the bodies of living animals, it is only necessary to bleed one and observe the effects of the operation. When the flow of blood continues for a long time, the animal falls into syncope, fainting, and if the bleeding be not arrested, all motion ceases in a few moments, respiration is stopped, and life is no longer manifest by external sign. If the animal be left in this condition, reality soon takes the place of appearance, and death speedily follows. But if we inject into his veins blood similar to that which he has lost, we see with astonishment this semblance of a corpse return to life, in proportion as additional quantities of blood are introduced into the vessels, he revives more and more, and soon breathes freely, moves with facility, resumes his habitual gait, and is completely re-established. This operation, known under the name of transfusion, is certainly one of the most remarkable that has been performed, and proves, better than all we could say, the importance of the action of the globules of the blood upon the living organs. For if we make use of serum, that is, blood deprived of its globules, in the same manner, we produce no more effect than if we had used pure water, and death is not a less inevitable consequence of the hemorrhage. The influence of the blood upon the nutrition of the organs may be demonstrated with equal facility. When by mechanical means we diminish, in an appreciable and permanent degree, the quantity of this fluid received by an organ, we perceive that it dwindles in size, and often even decays and becomes reduced to almost nothing. On the other hand, we observe that the more any one part of the body is exercised, the greater the quantity of blood it receives, and the more it augments in volume. Indeed, everyone knows that muscular exercise tends most to the development of those parts which are the seat of it, that in dancers, for example, the muscles of the legs, the calf in particular, acquire an extraordinary size, while with bakers and other men who perform hard labor with their arms, the superior members or extremities become more fleshy than any other parts. Now the muscles receive more blood when in action than when in repose, and by this afflux of blood the nutritive act of which they are the seat is stimulated and their volume is increased. The blood, in giving nourishment to the organs, and in exciting the vital movement, undergoes a change. It is impoverished not only by the deposit of the particles which the organs appropriate to themselves and incorporate with their substance, but also by receiving the old materials, which are separated from the tissue of these same organs, and which, having become useless or even injurious, have to be expelled from the body. Consequently, there is a very great difference between the blood going to the organs and that which has already passed through them, and which has contributed to their nourishment. To the first is given the name of arterial blood, and to the second, the name of venous blood. 
arterial blood is of a vermilion red it coagulates very easily and contains a large proportion of globules and finally it is essentially necessary to the maintenance of life venous blood is of a blackish red color it is less coagulable and less rich than the arterial blood but what distinguishes it above every other quality is that after having passed through them it is no longer capable of exciting the vital movement in the organs notwithstanding the blood thus vitiated does not cease to be useful because it easily regains its vivifying qualities by action of the air the venous blood is changed into arterial blood it regains its vermilion color and becomes again fit for the maintenance of life it is this transformation of venous blood into arterial blood which constitutes the phenomenon of respiration end of lesson two recording by mackenzie nicole greenwood Lesson 3 of The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rushenberger. Lesson 3. The Circulation of the Blood. The blood does not remain at rest in the body. It is constantly passing through the organs which it nourishes, and returning to the respiratory apparatus to come in contact with the air to be again distributed to the organs the continuous passage of the blood from the respiratory apparatus towards all the organs of the body and the return of the blood from these organs to the apparatus of respiration constitutes the phenomenon of the circulation this liquid as we have seen moves continually in a sort of circle after having traversed all the parts which it is destined to nourish it returns to a particular organ to come in contact with the air then goes back to the parts whence it came passes through them returns again to the apparatus of respiration and so continues as long as life endures the apparatus of the circulation that is to say the assemblage of organs destined to effect this conveyance or transportation of the blood is composed first of canals or pipes in which the blood runs second of the heart which serves to set it in motion the heart is the center of the apparatus of the circulation it is a sort of fleshy pouch communicating with the blood vessels which receiving the blood into its interior and which by contracting on itself from time to time forces this fluid into the canals and thus keeps up a continual current in them almost all animals have a heart this organ exists not only in the mammalia birds reptiles and fishes but also in snails oysters and other animals of the class of mollusca in crabs and lobsters in spiders etc the blood vessels are of two kinds namely first the arteries which carry the blood from the heart to all parts of the body second the veins which bring this liquid back from all parts of the body to the heart the arteries spring from the heart and divide into branches which decrease in size and increase in number as they advance and are distributed to the very numerous parts distant from the heart the veins present a similar disposition but which is designed to produce an entirely opposite result because the blood in these vessels pursues an inverse course they are very numerous at a distance from the heart but little by little they unite to form larger canals which in turn again unite so that they terminate at the heart in only one or two large trunks the ultimate ramifications of the arteries in the substance of the organs are continued into the radicals of the veins so as to form a series of uninterrupted and narrow canals through which the blood passes through the organs to these delicate canals which establish the communication between the termination of the arteries and the beginning of the veins is applied to the name of capillary vessels this name has been given to them in consideration of their extreme fineness which makes them comparable to hairs at the extremity opposite to that where we find the capillary vessels the arteries and veins also communicate with each other by the intervention of the cavities of the heart the result of this arrangement is that the vascular apparatus forms a complete circle in which the blood moves constantly returning to its point of departure the circulating circle may be compared to a tree the trunk of which is doubled upon itself so as to cause the ultimate ramifications of the branches to meet the ultimate divisions of the roots 
the upper portion of the trunk and roots would represent the veins. In all those animals which most resemble man anatomically, such as the monkey, the dog, horse, ox, etc., the heart is placed between the two lungs, in the cavity of the chest, which anatomists call the thorax. The general form of the heart is that of an inverted cone, the apex down and a little to the left. The size of the heart is very nearly that of the fist of the individual to whom it belongs. This organ is enveloped in a double membranous sac called pericardium and is suspended in the pericardium by the vessels which arise from its superior and enlarged entremity, but it does not adhere at any other point of its surface to the neighboring parts. The substance of the heart is almost entirely fleshy. It is a hollow muscle, the cavity of which communicates with the arteries and veins. In man and all the mammalia, as well as birds, it has four distinct cavities. A thick vertical partition divides it into two halves, each one forming two cavities, one above the other, a ventricle and an auricle. The two ventricles occupy the inferior part of the heart and do not communicate with each other, but each one opens into the auricle above it. The cavities of the left side of the heart contain arterial blood and those of the right side venous blood. The vessels which convey arterial blood into all the organs take their origin from the left ventricle of the heart through the medium of a single trunk called the aorta. This great artery first mounts upwards toward the base of the neck, then bends downwards, forming a sort of crook, passes behind the heart and descends vertically in front of the spine to the lower part of the belly. In its course, the aorta gives off a great number of branches, the principal of which are, first, the two carotid arteries, mount along the sides of the neck and supply the head with blood. Second, the two arteries of the upper extremities successively obtain the names of subclavian, axillary, and brachial arteries as they pass under the clavicle or cross the armpit or descend along the arm to the elbow where they divide into two branches called the radial and ulnar or cubital arteries. Third, the intercostal arteries are several in number and run between the ribs on each side of the body. Fourth, the celiac artery, which is distributed to the stomach, the liver, and the spleen. Fifth, the mesenteric arteries, which ramify upon the intestines. Sixth, the renal arteries, which penetrate into the kidneys. And seventh, the iliac arteries, which in a manner terminate the aorta, and which convey blood to the lower extremities, descend along the thighs, and are there called femoral arteries. Then they divide into many branches which terminate in the feet. The veins which receive the blood thus transmitted to all parts of the body follow very nearly the same course as the arteries, but they are larger, more numerous, and generally situated more superficially. A great number of these vessels pass beneath the skin, others accompany the arteries, and at last they all unite to form two great trunks which empty into the right oracle of the heart and which have received the names of vena cava superior and vena cava inferior. The veins which come from the intestines present an important peculiarity. After uniting in a large trunk, they penetrate the liver and there ramify like the arteries. There they again unite into a trunk and terminate in the inferior vena cava close to the heart. This arrangement of the vessels is called the system of the vena porta. The venous blood, poured by the vena cava into the right auricle of the heart, descends from it into the ventricle of the same side. The right ventricle of the heart gives rise to a large artery, called the pulmonary artery, which next receives this same blood and carries it into the lungs. This vessel divides into two branches, one going to the right and the other to the left, to enter the two corresponding lungs, and are divided into an almost infinity of branches, which are spread over the surface of the little membranous cells of these organs. The capillary vessels by which the pulmonary arteries terminate give rise to veins, which unite together and finally form two large vessels, called pulmonary veins, which empty into the left auricle of the heart. Consequently, the pulmonary veins receive the venous blood, which was brought to the lungs by the pulmonary artery, and which has now become arterial by the effect produced on it, by contact with the air in the interior of these organs. They carry it back again to the heart and pour it into the left auricle. Finally, from the left auricle, this fluid descends into the left ventricle, 
whence we have already seen it issue to be distributed to the different parts of the body through the medium of the aorta and its branches. To recapitulate what has just been said, on the route pursued by the blood in the apparatus of the circulation in mammiferous animals and birds, we see, first, that the venous blood arrives from all parts of the body by the general system of veins. Second, that from these veins it enters the right auricle of the heart. Third, that from the right auricle it passes into the right ventricle. Fourth, that from the right ventricle the venous blood passes through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Fifth, that in the capillary vessels which form the termination of the pulmonary artery and commencement of the pulmonary veins, this liquid is changed into arterial blood. Sixth, that this arterial blood returns from the lungs through the pulmonary veins and enters the left auricle of the heart. Seventh, that from the left auricle it descends into the ventricle of the same side. Eighth, that from the left ventricle it is forced into the aorta, by which it is distributed to all parts of the body. And ninth, and finally, that in the capillary terminations of the system of canals formed by the aorta, the arterial blood acts upon the organs, is changed there into venous blood and enters the veins to be carried again to the heart. In accomplishing the circulatory circle, the blood then passes twice through the heart, in the state of venous blood on the right side and in the state of arterial blood in the left side of this organ. Yet the circulation is complete, because the pulmonary and aortic cavities of the heart do not open one into the other, and the venous blood passes through the entire respiratory apparatus to be transmuted into arterial blood. The mechanism by which the blood moves through these vessels is easily understood. The cavities of the heart contract and enlarge alternately, and by contracting they force the blood into the canals with which they, the cavities, are in communication. The two ventricles contract at the same time, and while their sides or parietes relax, the auricles in their turn contract. The movement of contraction bears the name of systole, and the term diastole is applied to the opposite movement, or dilatation. The beating or pulsation of the heart is very frequent. In man of adult age, it takes place from 60 to 75 times in a minute. In old men, the number of beats is a little increased, and in very young infants, it is generally about 120. But a variety of circumstances may influence both the frequency and force of the beats of the heart. They are accelerated by exercise, by moral emotions, and by a great number of diseases. In swooning or syncope, they are considerably diminished, or even completely interrupted. The left ventricle in dilating fills with blood, and in contracting afterwards, forces out the liquid which it contains. This ventricle communicates only with the left auricle by an opening called the auriculoventricular opening, and with the aorta. The blood, at the moment of its contraction, must then either flow back into the auricle or enter the aorta. Now, around the edges of this auriculoventricular opening, there is a sort of valve, called the mitral valve, which is so arranged as to rise up and close this opening when it is pushed from below upwards. From this construction it happens that when the blood tends towards entering the auricle, the mitral valve is pushed up and interrupts the communication between the auricle and ventricle. Therefore, when the left ventricle contracts, the blood finds no other outlet than the aorta, and enters this vessel, which it distends with more or less force, for its parietes, as well as those of all the arteries, are very elastic. Other valves, situate at the entrance of the aorta, prevent the blood from returning into the left ventricle so that, pressed by the elastic force of the arterial parietes, it is continually pushed forward from the heart towards the extremities of the arteries. The phenomenon known under the name of the pulse is nothing else than the motion caused by the pressure of the blood against the parietes of the arteries every time that the heart contracts. According to the frequency and force of these motions, we may judge of the manner in which the organ beats, and draw therefrom deductions useful in medicine. But the pulse is not felt in all parts. To perceive it, we must slightly compress an artery of a certain volume between the finger and a resisting surface of a bone, for example, and select a vessel situated near the skin as the radial artery at the wrist. 
The impulsion received by the blood at its exit from the left ventricle of the heart is communicated to the capillary vessels and to the veins, and determines the progression of the blood in them. But the return of the venous blood towards the right ventricle is favored by some other circumstances. In the veins of the extremities, the membrane which lines these vessels forms a great many folds or valves, which open when the blood pushes them from the extremities towards the heart, and shut so as to close the passage when this fluid flows in a contrary direction. Now this arrangement prevents the blood from flowing back towards the capillaries, and thus facilitates its passage towards the heart, for every time a vein is pressed by the movements of the parts in its vicinity, the blood is pushed forward. The passage of the blood through the right cavities of the heart is effected in the same manner as in the left cavities. Between the right auricle and right ventricle there also exists a valve, called the tricuspid valve, which prevents the blood from returning from the ventricle into the auricle, and by the contractions of this ventricle the blood is forced to circulate in the vessels of the lungs and to arrive at the left auricle. It is the ventricles, as we have seen, which force the blood into the arteries and cause it to circulate. The auricles are a sort of reservoirs, designed to contain the blood arriving by the veins and to pour it into the corresponding ventricles. Such is the march of the blood, not only in man and all the mammalia, but also in birds. In the sequel we shall see that in reptiles and fishes the structure of the heart is less complicated, and that the blood follows a somewhat different direction. Of Absorption The blood, in passing through the veins from their capillary origin in the substance of the organs to their termination in the right auricle of the heart, carries with it all the fluids which in some way filter through the parietes of these vessels. Fluid substances which may be in contact with the surface of the body and of the great hollow cavities in its interior, or which are deposited in the depth of the organs, are, as it were, pumped up more or less rapidly and carried into the torrent of the circulation. To the passage of substances, of whatever kind, from the exterior into the interior of the blood vessels, through their parietes, or particular canals, and their mixture with the blood, is given the name of absorption. Substances thus absorbed generally penetrate directly into the veins, but under some circumstances they are carried thither by particular canals called lymphatic vessels. In describing the act of digestion, we shall have occasion to refer again to these vessels. All parts of the body may be the seat of a more or less rapid absorption. It is by this phenomenon that liquids introduced into the stomach are found, a very short time afterwards, mingled with the venous blood, and that certain vapors, mixed with the air drawn into the lungs, sometimes act upon remote parts of the body, such as the brain, as happens when we breathe alcoholic vapors. It is also by absorption alone that we can explain how poisons applied to the lips, the eye, or to a slight erosion of the skin penetrate into the interior of the body and cause death, often with as much rapidity as if they had been conveyed directly into the stomach. It is by the absorption which takes place in the substance of all the organs that the old materials, no longer of use and separated from the living tissues by the nutritive act, are poured into the circulating torrent to be carried out of the body. Of Exhalation and of Secretion the blood in circulating through the body is not limited to the nutrition of the organs through which it passes and to mingling with it absorbed matters. On passing into certain parts of the body, it abandons a portion of the matters which it contains and in this way gives birth to the peculiar liquids called humors. This separation of the contained matters from the blood may take place in two ways, by exhalation and by secretion. Exhalation is the separation of a portion of the most aqueous part of the blood, which in some manner filters through the parietes of the vessels. The exhaled liquids do not differ much from serum, except that they contain more water. Sometimes they accumulate in the internal cavities of the body, at others they are diffused over the surface and are evaporated into the air. It is in this way that a considerable quantity of vapor escapes from the lungs, and a very active evaporation takes place upon the surface of the skin. Secretion is the production of certain liquids which resemble the serum in nothing, 
and which are also formed at the expense of the blood. Tears, saliva, bile, urine, etc., are liquids secreted in this way. The phenomenon of secretion always takes place in particular organs. Sometimes it is seated in the follicles, and sometimes in the glands. The follicles are very small pouches which are strewed through substance of the membranes, and which open upon their surface by small pores. The follicles of the skin secrete the sweat, those on the edge of the eyelids, which secrete the yellow matter, which sometimes accumulates during sleep, are organs of this kind. The glands are more voluminous organs, composed of small granulations united in a compact and distinct mass. These granulations are the seat of secretion, and they generally communicate externally by small tubes or conduits, which uniting together like the roots of a tree, finally form an excretory canal by which the secreted liquid is poured out. The salivary glands, which secrete the saliva, the lacrimal glands, which secrete the tears, and the liver, which secretes the bile, are organs of this class. The act of secretion is not designed simply to produce liquids useful in the exercise of certain functions, such as the saliva and bile, but also to free the blood from the old materials, separated from the tissue of the organs by the act of nutrition, and other useless or injurious matters, which may become mixed with it by the effect of absorption. The secretion of urine, which takes place in the kidneys, situated in the abdomen, one on each side of the spine, and the expulsion of it which follows, is the principal means by which this sort of purification of the blood is effected. End of Lesson 3《Lesson Four of the Elements of Anatomy and Physiology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Ruschenberger. Lesson Four: Functions of Nutrition, Respiration, Necessity of Contact with Air, Asphyxia composition of the atmosphere principal phenomena of respiration the lungs mechanism of respiration animal heat we have already seen that the arterial blood by its action upon the living tissues loses those qualities which make it fit for the support of animal life and after having been in this way vitiated it regains its first properties by contact with air. The transformation of venous into arterial blood by the action of the air constitutes the phenomenon of respiration. Respiration, and consequently contact with the air, is indispensable to all living beings. Plants, as well as animals, feel the want of it, and, when deprived of it, both very soon perish. When from any cause whatever respiration is arrested, all the animal functions are disturbed. Life soon ceases to be manifest. The animal falls into a state of asphyxia, or apparent death, and in a very short time life becomes entirely extinct. At first sight, we might believe that animals which live in the depths of the waters, as fishes, are removed from the influence of the air, and consequently form an exception to the law of which we have spoken. But it is not so, for the liquid in which they dwell absorbs and holds in solution a certain quantity of air which may be easily separated from it, and which is sufficient for the support of life in them. It is impossible for them to exist in water deprived of its air." and they are seen to become asphyxiated and die just as the mammiferae and birds do when excluded from the action of the atmospheric air under its ordinary form in man and in other mammalia the apparatus of respiration consists first of the lungs organs which are the seat of this function second of canals by which the air from without is conveyed into the lungs 
third of organs which effect the entrance of the air into this apparatus and which afterwards expel it to make room for fresh supplies of this fluid the lungs figure eleven are very elastic spongy organs contained in the cavity of the chest and formed by the union of a great number of membranous vesicles resembling little cells which generally communicate with one another into these vesicles is introduced the external air when it penetrates their cavities it distends them and thus augments the entire volume of the lung which happens in inspiration on the contrary when the lungs are emptied of the air which distends them their volume diminishes as happens in expiration the lungs communicate with the external air by a long canal which is terminated by the mouth and nose the air to reach these organs passes through the nasal fossae or nostrils or through the mouth into the pharynx then enters into the larynx descends along the trachea or windpipe and is distributed to the pulmonary cells by other canals or tubes called bronchae the nasal fossae and the mouth terminate internally in the pharynx or gullet so that the supply of air necessary for respiration may reach this cavity by either route at the bottom of the pharynx or swallow we find an opening called the glottis which leads into the larynx and permits the air to enter therein the larynx is a short tube of considerable diameter situated at the superior and anterior part of the neck and which contributes to the production of the voice the larynx is prolonged inferiorly into a long tube called the trachea or windpipe which descends through the neck and enters into the thorax this tube is formed by a series of cartilaginous rings and is lined internally by a thin membrane which also lines the larynx and is continuous with that of the pharynx the cartilaginous rings of the trachea are very elastic and prevent this air canal from being effaced that is from having its sides pressed together and thus offer an obstacle to the passage of the air at its lower extremity the trachea is divided into two branches one going to each of the two lungs they are called bronchia soon after they enter the lungs these bronchia are subdivided and ramify into almost infinity of branches so as to furnish every pulmonary cell with a little branch which opens into it and conveys there the air necessary to respiration the instrument which causes the air to pass through these tubes and to enter the lungs or to go out from them is the thorax figure twelve the mechanism by which this phenomenon is produced is very simple and in almost every respect resembles the play of a pair of bellows except that the air escapes by the same passage that it entered the lungs which is not the case in the bellows the lungs are lodged in a great cavity called the chest or thorax the sides of which are movable so arranged as to enlarge and diminish the size of the cavity alternately the lungs follow these motions and dilate and contract in consequence now in the first case when the thorax dilates the air pressed by all the weight of the surrounding atmosphere is forced into the chest and through the mouth or nostrils and trachea and fills the pulmonary cells in the same way that water mounts in the body of a pump when the piston is raised in the second case in the act of expiration the air contained in the lungs is on the contrary compressed and partially escapes by the route which served it for entrance the cavity of the thorax figure thirteen is formed principally by the ribs which are attached posteriorly to the spine or vertebral column and in front to the bone of the sternum the spaces which exist between the ribs 
are filled up by muscles and below this species of chamber is separated from the belly by a fleshy partition called the diaphragm inspiration or the enlargement of the chest is produced in two ways first by the elevation of the ribs second by the muscular contraction of the diaphragm which in a state of repose rises into the chest in the form of an arch and which in contracting is lowered down expiration or contraction of the chest on the contrary is produced by the depression of the ribs and relaxation of the diaphragm we observe many degrees in the extent of these movements and in ordinary respiration the quantity of air received into or expelled from the lungs does not much exceed one-seventh part of what these organs are capable of containing the number of respiratory movements varies in different individuals according to the age in adult age we count about twenty inspirations a minute in infancy they are much more frequent we have seen that it is by the nose or mouth the pharynx the larynx the trachea and the bronchia that the air enters into the lungs the venous blood which is to be subjected to the salutary influence of this air arrives at the same time in little vessels which ramify in every direction over the sides of the cells consequently it is through the very sides of these capillary vessels that the air acts upon this fluid the blood coming to the lungs is of a blackish red color and it is not fit to support life in the organs but so soon as it comes into contact with the air it changes its nature its color becomes a bright red regains its vivifying properties and acquires all the characteristics of arterial blood the atmospheric air which thus enters into the lungs and there produces so remarkable a phenomena is chiefly composed of two substances which differ very much from each other namely oxygen and azote or nitrogen though the oxygen which enters into the composition of the air forms about one-fifth twenty-one parts in the hundred it is its most important part it is to the oxygen that the air owes its property of supporting life and of sustaining the burning of combustible bodies when inflamed azote or nitrogen which enters into the composition of the air in the proportion of seventy-nine parts in a hundred is unfit for respiration and incapable of supporting combustion it seems to serve only to dilute the oxygen and thus mitigate the otherwise too irritating action of this gas by being breathed the air changes its nature its oxygen disappears little by little and is replaced by another fluid called carbonic acid gas this carbonic acid gas is composed of oxygen combined with carbon derived from the blood instead of being fit to support life it acts as a poison on animals that breathe it for a short time and causes death on this account by the respiration of animals the air is gradually vitiated and if it were not renewed would soon occasion asphyxia carbonic acid gas which extinguishes bodies in combustion in the same way as azote is formed by the combustion of charcoal also during the fermentation of wine and of beer which makes it sparkling and frothy it is upon the action of this gas on the animal economy that the asphyxia produced by the vapor of charcoal depends as well as the greater number of accidents of the same sort which occur in mines caves wells and vats wherein wine or beer is fermenting in a grotto near naples this gas is continuously disengaged from the earth and give rise to phenomena which at first sight appear very singular 
and excite the admiration of the traveller when a man enters this cavern he experiences no inconvenience in his respiration but a dog following him very soon falls down in a state of asphyxia at his feet and would soon expire were he not speedily removed to the pure air this arises from the fact that the carbonic acid gas being much heavier than the air sinks down and forms upon the bottom of the cave a bed or stratum of about two feet thick now a dog that enters the grotto is necessarily plunged over his head into this mephitic gas and must necessarily become asphyxiate while a man who is very much taller only has the lower part of his body exposed to the action of the carbonic acid and breathes freely the air which floats above this remarkable place is known under the name of the grotto del cano or dog's grotto the air which escapes from the lungs is composed of the nitrogen inspired of a portion of oxygen not employed and of carbonic acid furnished by the act of respiration the expired air is also loaded with vapour of water exhaled from the blood during its passage through the capillary vessels of the lungs this vapour becomes very perceptible when the cold condenses it at the moment of its issue from the body and constitute what physiologists call pulmonary transpiration since the air is quickly vitiated by respiration and its oxygen disappears to be replaced by the carbonic acid we readily infer that this fluid must be constantly renewed in the lungs and in fact that this takes place in consequence of the alternate movements of inspiration and expiration we are informed of the degree of alteration which the air has undergone in our lungs by the sensation which it induces us to renew it this sensation scarcely appreciable in ordinary respiration because we hasten to comply with the necessity of frequently renewing the air becomes painful if not promptly satisfied and is sometimes accompanied by anxiety and even agony an instructive warning of the imperious necessity of respiration in man there is commonly twenty inspirations per minute in all the mammalia in birds and in reptiles respiration takes place in lungs and very nearly in the same manner as in man in the greater number of aquatic animals such as fishes lobsters oysters etc it is altogether different and respiration takes place through the medium of a sort of membranous fringes called branchiae we shall recur to this in the sequel the air necessary to the support of life in insects penetrates into all parts of their bodies through particular canals called trachea finally there are some animals which have neither lungs nor branchia nor trachea in which respiration is accomplished by the surface of the skin the earthworm is an example of this kind the greater number of animals appear cold when we touch them and indeed the temperature of their bodies is not much above that of the atmosphere and changes with it in man and in other animals that approach him in their organization it is otherwise they have the faculty of producing a sufficient quantity of calorie to maintain their temperatures nearly always at the same degree under all atmospheric changes and keep themselves warm we designate under the name of cold-blooded animals all those whose proper heat is not very perceivable and call those warm-blooded animals which produce sufficient heat independently of the atmosphere surrounding them the production of this heat which is called animal heat seems to depend upon the act of respiration the combination of the oxygen of the air with the venous blood in the interior of the lungs as we have already seen causes the formation of certain quantity of carbonic acid gas in the same manner as in the case where oxygen combines with carbon in producing the phenomenon of combustion and in both instances must extricate a greater or lesser quantity of heat 
the faculty of thus producing heat is common to all animals but the greater part of them develop it in so small a degree that it is not appreciable by our ordinary thermometers while in others it is so great that we do not require physical instruments to ascertain its existence the only warm-blooded animals are the mammalia and birds all the rest are cold-blooded the temperature of the body of man is about a hundred and one degrees of fahrenheit it is about the same in other mammalia but birds produce more heat their temperature rising to about a hundred and eight degrees fahrenheit End of lesson four. Lesson five of the Elements of Anatomy and Physiology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rushenberger lesson five functions of nutrition digestion mouth the prehension of elements mastication teeth their structure the manner of their formation their form and use saliva salivary glands deglutition pharynx esophagus one the blood as we have seen in nourishing all the organs it may be said loses somewhat of its properties and requires to retrieve the losses which it thus undergoes now it is renewed by receiving new materials from the productions of the earth too these materials destined to the support of the blood and consequently to the support of the whole body are furnished by the various elements or food three that they may be nourished all living beings require that alimentary substance should be introduced into their bodies from time to time for plants pump up by their roots the elements furnished them by the earth and these matters are mingled with the nutritious liquid called sap which permeates throughout their tissues without having undergone any preparation five with animals it is altogether different the elements previously to being absorbed and diffused through the different parts of the body to afford nourishment to the organs and to enter into the composition of their tissues have to undergo a certain process of preparation called digestion six digestion has for its object first to separate from alimentary substances the nutritive part from that which is not second to transform this nutritive part into a peculiar liquid fit to mix with the blood and nourish the organs which liquid is called chyle seven the process of digestion always takes place in a cavity situated in the interior of the body and communicating externally in such a way that elements may enter it eight all animals are provided with a digestive cavity nine plants on the contrary having no need to digest elements have no such cavity the elementary surface of a plant is the exterior of its root spread out in the earth ten in some animals the digestive cavity is simply a pouch communicating externally by a single opening which performs the functions both of a mouth and of an anus eleven but with the greatest number it is otherwise the digestive cavity has the form of a tube open at its two ends and enlarged about the middle this enlarged portion of the digestive tube is named stomach and serves to contain the elements while the greatest part of the process of digestion is performed twelve the superior opening of this tube is the mouth it is through it that food enters the digestive cavity the inferior opening called anus is destined as an outlet to matters unfit for nutrition which are separated from the food by digestion thirteen in quadrupeds and most other animals we distinguish in this alimentary tube diverse portions the uses of which are different they are first the mouth 
second the pharynx or swallow third the esophagus fourth the stomach fifth the intestine fourteen other organs or instruments also concur to effect the digestion of food and constitute with the tube of which we have just spoken the digestive apparatus the principal are first the teeth destined to divide and grind the food second certain glands such as the liver and salivary glands serve to form the humours which act upon the food in order to determine its digestion third of particular vessels destined to pump into the intestine the nutritious juices produced by digestion and to mix them with the blood in short we might consider as being in some sort auxiliary to the digestive apparatus certain organs with which certain animals seize their food and introduce it into the mouth but these instruments principally serve other purposes and do not really belong to the apparatus of digestion fifteen the process of digestion is very complicated and is made up of several phenomena or distinct acts which take place in different parts of the digestive apparatus and which have for instruments particular organs sixteen these phenomena are first the prehension of aliments second mastication third insalivation fourth deglutition fifth chymification or stomach digestion sixth chylification or intestinal digestion seventh absorption of chyle eighth the expulsion of the residue left by the elements after digestion is finished we will now study successively these different phenomena and the organs which produce them of the prehension of elements seventeen the first phenomenon of the process of digestion is the prehension of elements that is the act of seizing them and introducing them into the mouth eighteen the mouth is a cavity of an oval form closed in front by the lips on the sides by the cheeks and jaws above by the palate and below by the tongue behind it is continuous with the pharynx or swallow but is separated from it by a kind of curtain called the velum palati veil of the palate and which may be elevated or depressed so as to close the passage or leave it free nineteen the entrance of the mouth may be closed or opened by movements of the jaw and lips on the prehension of aliment the latter are separated to permit the entrance of the substance and are immediately afterwards closed to prevent its escape twenty with most animals the prehension of aliments is performed by the lips and jaws alone but with some other organs are employed to seize the substances and convey them to the mouth with man and monkeys the hand thus becomes the chief instrument of the prehension of aliments with the elephant it is his trunk and with parrots the claw twenty one with most animals the food remains for some time in the mouth to be chewed and mixed with saliva of mastication twenty two liquid aliments may be immediately swallowed but solid food to be swallowed and digested with facility should be previously divided into very small morsels twenty three this division called mastication is effected by the aid of the teeth which set in motion by the jaws press upon the food and cut or crush it twenty four in man and those animals which in their organization resemble us most the two jaws are situated one above the other the upper jaw is fixed immovably to the cranium but the lower jaw is only attached to it at its posterior part and is there held on each side by a sort of hinge or joint which permits it to be separated from and approached to the upper jaw twenty five the muscles which serve to bring the jaws together and which consequently act most during mastication are placed on each side of the head in front of the ear and when we press the teeth together we can feel that they contract twenty six in most mammalia the edges of the jaws are armed with teeth twenty seven the teeth are small bodies of great hardness which resemble bone very much they are planted in holes 
hollowed into the jaws which holes are named alveoli twenty eight the fibrous pads which cover the edge of the jaws and which are called gums serve as well as the alveoli to fix the teeth solidly in the position which they occupy twenty nine generally each tooth is divided into two parts one is situated without and called the crown the other buried in the alveolus and terminated by one or more points is called the root of the tooth finally we often remark between the crown and the root a slight shrinking called the neck of the tooth thirty the teeth are composed of an internal substance called ivory and a sort of extremely hard stony varnish which covers the surface and is called enamel thirty one the crown of the tooth only is covered with enamel the root has it not thirty two the teeth are formed in the interior of the jaws and within little membranous pouches called dental capsules which are enclosed within the substance of the bone and which present in their interior a fleshy bud or granule from the surface of which exudes the stony matter of which the tooth is composed thirty three this stony matter is the ivory it moulds itself upon the bud and takes its form just in proportion as new quantities of ivory are deposited upon that already formed the tooth enlarges as well as the species of case which it forms around the bud which shrinks away until finally the little organ being too much compressed disappears the tooth then ceases to grow thirty four in proportion as the tooth is formed as we have just said it rises in the alveolus passes through the gum and shows itself without thirty five the enamel is formed at the superior portion of the dental capsule and is applied upon the tooth just to the extent it traverses that part of the capsule it is for this reason that the root which remains at the bottom of the alveolus is never covered by it thirty six the teeth which are formed in the earliest period of life are destined soon to fall and to give place to other teeth stronger and more solidly fixed the first are called milk teeth or deciduous teeth or teeth of the first dentition the second the permanent teeth or teeth of second dentition thirty seven the teeth are divided into three kinds namely thirty eight first the incisive or incisor which occupy the front of the mouth and terminate in a thin cutting edge have but one simple root and are fit for cutting the various elements thirty nine second the canine which are placed on each side and next to the incisors are in general long and pointed they also have only a single root but it penetrates deeply into the jaw their principal use is to fix themselves in the flesh upon which the animal feeds and to tear it forty third the molar teeth or grinders which are next to the canine occupy the sides of the mouth they are generally provided with several roots and present a large unequal crown appropriate for grinding the food forty one the molar teeth are subdivided into false molar dentis biscupendi and great molar the first are smaller than the second and are situated in front of them the roots of the great molars are also more numerous which gives them more solidity and power forty two the number of teeth varies in different animals man monkeys the dog the cat and so forth have the three sorts of teeth we have just described but with the rabbit the rat and the other gnawers rodentia the canine teeth are wanting and in other quadrupeds such as the sloth there are no incisors finally there are also animals that are entirely unprovided with teeth the anteater and birds for example forty three the form of the teeth also varies in different animals and we remark that these differences are in accordance with the nature or kind of aliment upon which these beings are destined to be nourished forty four thus with the dog the cat and other carnivorous animals the molar teeth are sharp and fitted to cut flesh like scissors 
with the mole and hedgehog that live upon pretty hard insects these teeth are armed with conical points which dovetail or fit reciprocally and enable these animals to crush their prey with facility with the frugivorous animals monkeys for example the same teeth are large and their crown is armed with rounded elevations suitable for crushing fruits and with the ox and horse which browse or crop the grass the crown of these teeth is still larger and its surface is flat and striated like a millstone forty five in man the deciduous or milk teeth begin to appear about the sixth or seventh month and fall about the seventh year they are in number twenty namely in each jaw four incisor two canine one on each side and four molar two on each side forty six the permanent or teeth of second dentition are in number thirty two forty seven the incisor and canine are the same in number as in the first dentition but in place of two molars on each side of each jaw there are five the total number of molar teeth in adult man is consequently twenty ten in each jaw forty eight the five molar teeth on each side are divided into two kinds namely two false molars and three great molars of insalivation forty nine during the act of mastication the food is mixed with the saliva which phenomenon is designated under the name of insalivation fifty the saliva is a watery fluid colourless and frothy which is formed in particular organs called salivary glands fifty one in man these glands are six in number three on each side of the face and are called parotid submaxillary and sublingual fifty two the parotid glands are the largest they are placed beneath the skin between the ear and the jaw and empty the saliva into the mouth by a long straight tube which opens on the inside or internal face of the cheeks fifty three the submaxillary glands are smaller than the parotid and are lodged below and behind the lower jaw fifty four the sublingual glands are smaller than the preceding and are found under the tongue fifty five the saliva serves to render the deglutition of food more easy and contributes to accelerate digestion of deglutition fifty six the food conveniently prepared by mastication and in salivation unites upon the back of the tongue in a little mass called an alimentary ball or bolus fifty seven the alimentary ball is next swallowed we give the name of deglutition to this phenomenon which consists in the passing of food from the mouth into the stomach through the pharynx and esophagus fifty eight the opening which occupies the back part of the mouth and which forms the communication between this cavity and the pharynx is called the isthmus of the throat isthmus van cecum during mastication it is closed by the veil of the palate velum palati but when deglutition is about to take place this species of curtain is raised and the alimentary ball is pushed into the pharynx fifty nine the pharynx is a cavity situated between the base of the cranium and the front of the neck above it communicates with the nasal fossa by the posterior nares or nostrils a u as well as with the mouth and below it presents two openings one by which it is continuous with the esophagus the other situated in front and called glottis by which it communicates with the larynx and windpipe we may compare it to a cross-road where the route followed by the air to get from the nose to the lungs crosses the route followed by the food to get from the mouth to the esophagus sixty that deglutition may be effected the alimentary ball must pass beneath the posterior nostrils and over the glottis without entering it and descend directly into the esophagus sixty one the veil of the palate by being raised up and placed obliquely against the posterior wall of the pharynx forms beneath the posterior nostrils a sort of screen which hinders the food from mounting upwards 
and entering the nose from behind during the act of swallowing sixty two that the food may not enter the glottis it closes at the moment of deglutition and at the same time the larynx is raised up against the base of the tongue a movement which forces a valve situated above the glottis and called epiglottis to fall and close the opening sixty three sometimes however deglutition not being properly effected the food penetrates into the larynx and at once brings on a fit of coughing when this happens it is said we swallow crosswise sixty four the esophagus or gullet is continuous with the pharynx it is a long membranous tube which descends from the superior part of the neck behind the windpipe enters the thorax passes behind the heart and lungs pierces the diaphragm and terminates in the stomach sixty five the pharynx and esophagus are furnished with a layer of fleshy fibres which are placed transversely in rings which contracting successively from above downwards convey the alimentary ball into the stomach end of lesson five lesson six of the elements of anatomy and physiology this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by kathleen the elements of anatomy and physiology by william rushenberger lesson six functions of nutrition stomach digestion or chymification intestinal digestion or calification bile and liver pancreas and pancreatic juice large intestine absorption of chyle chyliferous vessels recapitulation of the functions of nutrition of stomach digestion or chymification one food begins to be digested in the stomach it is there transformed into chyme and we give to this phenomenon the name of stomach digestion or chymification two the stomach is a membranous pouch placed transversely at the superior part of the abdomen or belly it has the form of a bagpipe and presents two openings one situate to the left and called cardia because it is nearest to the heart communicates with the esophagus the other called pylorus from the greek pouloros a gatekeeper because it shuts up the food in the stomach until converted into chyme occupies the right extremity of this organ and empties into the intestines three immediately after the passage of the alimentary ball the cardia closes in such a manner as to hinder it from reascending again to the mouth the pylorus is also closed and the consequence is that the food is arrested in the stomach and forced to remain there a considerable time for while the aliment thus sojourns in the stomach it imbibes a peculiar liquid called gastric juice which converts it into chyme five the gastric juice is a watery and acid liquid which is generated in a great number of very small cavities lodged in the thickness of the parietes or coats of the stomach and named gastric follicles each one of these follicles communicates with the interior of this organ by a small pore and thus empties the gastric juice upon the food six by the action of the gastric juice the food is softened and little by little changed into a thick grayish pap which is called chyme seven as soon as the chyme is formed the pylorus relaxes and the stomach begins to perform a series of movements which by degrees push the alimentary mass towards this opening and then into the intestine these movements consist in the successive contraction of fleshy fibres which surround the stomach transversely and which contract one after the other from left to right of intestinal digestion or chylification eight 
the chyme which issues from the stomach enters the intestine where it serves to form chyle nine the intestine is a long membranous tube folded upon itself which forms a continuation of the stomach and which by its opposite extremity opens outwardly it is lodged in the abdomen and is retained in its place by folds of a very fine membrane called peritoneum which lines the parietes or walls of this cavity the folds of peritoneum which connect the intestines to the spine bear the name of mesentery ten the parietes of the intestine are furnished with fleshy fibres which surround them and which by contracting successively push forward the matters contained within this tube these movements are called vermiform or vermicular because they resemble those of a worm when crawling eleven the length of the intestine is always very considerable but varies very much in different animals it is remarked that in those which are nourished by flesh exclusively it is much shorter than in those which live on vegetable substances thus in the lion which is essentially carnivorous it is only three times the length of the body while in man who is omnivorous its length is about six or seven times that of the body and in the sheep which eats grass only it is just twenty-eight times this length twelve the intestine is composed of two very distinct portions the small intestine and large intestine thirteen the small intestine is next to the stomach it is narrower than the large intestine and its external surface is smooth its length is very considerable and it is subdivided into three portions called duodenum jejunum and ileum fourteen in the small intestine the chyle is formed and digestion finished fifteen the phenomenon of chylification is produced by the mixture of the chyme with the bile and the pancreatic juice sixteen the bile or gall is a greenish and very bitter liquid secreted by the liver seventeen the liver is a large reddish gland and of a glandular tissue it is lodged in the superior part of the abdomen to the right of the stomach and presents upon its inferior surface a membranous pouch called the gallbladder the bile accumulates in this bladder as in a reservoir and is afterwards poured into the duodenum by a narrow canal called the biliary duct or ductus communis coliductus eighteen the pancreatic juice is a watery liquid which very much resembles saliva it is formed in a gland situate behind the stomach which is called the pancreas it reaches the duodenum by a narrow canal which arises in the pancreas and empties near the opening of the biliary duct nineteen the chyme mixed with the bile and pancreatic juice passes through the whole length of the small intestine and during its passage separates into two parts one called chyle which is deposited upon the sides of the intestine to be absorbed the other composed of those parts of the food which are not nutritious which continues its route and enters into the large intestine of the expulsion of the residue left after digestion twenty the alimentary matters which are not convertible into chyle require to be rejected and conveyed out of the body and for this purpose they enter into the large intestine and there accumulate twenty one the large intestine is the second portion of the intestinal tube it differs from the small intestine in its calibre its puffed form and in its uses it is divided into three portions the cecum the colon and the rectum twenty two the cecum is a swelling or dilatation wherein the small intestine terminates we remark there a thin worm-like prolongation which terminates in a cul-de-sac or blind canal and is called the cecal appendix appendicula vermiformis finally we find on its inside a sort of valve which hinders the matters contained in its cavity from returning into the small intestine twenty three the colon is next to the cecum and is continuous with the rectum which terminates at the anal opening or fundament of the absorption of chyle 
twenty four the chyle is a peculiar liquid resulting from the digestion of food and is deposited upon the parietes of the small intestines twenty five the physical properties of this liquid vary according to the nature of the food from which it is derived and according to the animals in which it is observed in man and most mammalia the chyle is generally a white opaque liquid very much resembling milk of an alkaline saltish taste and of a peculiar odor examined by the microscope it presents a multitude of globules analogous to those which form the central nucleus of the globules of the blood if left at rest it forms a mass like the blood and after some time separates into three parts a solid clot which occupies the bottom of the vessel a liquid resembling serum and a thin pellicle which swims on top and seems to be of a fatty nature twenty six the chyle is destined to be mixed with the blood to repair the losses which this liquid sustains by nourishing the organs and that this mixture may be effected it is pumped up by a particular set of vessels which pour it into the veins twenty seven this passage of the chyle from the intestine into the circulatory system is known under the name of absorption of chyle twenty eight the absorption of chyle is performed by the lymphatic vessels of the intestines which are called for this reason chyliferous vessels or lacteals from the appearance they present when filled with chyle twenty nine these vessels which are extremely delicate arise by imperceptible orifices on the mucous membrane that lines the bowel from different parts of the small intestine by a multitude of branches which little by little unite among themselves as we remarked of the veins and after having traversed the small organs called mesenteric glands empty into a conduit or canal called the thoracic duct thirty this duct or canal which also receives the lymphatic vessels from other parts of the body presents at its inferior extremity a dilatation called the reservoir of pecket or the receptaculum chyli it lies closely glued to the anterior face of the vertebral column or spine and mounts towards the thorax to terminate near the base of the neck in the subclavian vein of the left side thirty one the chyle in passing through the mesenteric glands seem to be perfected in some degree it assumes a rosy tint and becomes coagulable like the blood but it still differs very much from this liquid and we do not know with certainty in what part of the body it is changed into blood recapitulation of the functions of nutrition such are the different functions by the aid of which the nutrition of the body is effected thirty two the alimentary substances necessary for renewing the materials of which the organs are composed are derived as we have seen from sources exterior of the animal and in order to serve the purposes of nutrition require to undergo a peculiar preparation to which we give the name of digestion thirty three the chief of the functions of nutrition is consequently in man as in all other animals that of digestion thirty four the nutritious matters thus elaborated do not sojourn in the digestive cavity in order to support the organs they pass from this cavity into the very substance of the body itself to be mixed with the blood to this transportation from without to within and the passage of all substances from without into the torrent of the circulation is applied the term absorption thirty five the blood to convey in this way to all parts of the body materials to repair the organs must necessarily be the seat of continual currents and in fact this liquid finds its way wherever there is life to be supported this phenomenon is called the circulation thirty six in acting upon the tissues of the organs the blood loses a part of its vivifying properties and in order to regain them requires to be brought into contact with the atmospheric air which contact constitutes the phenomenon of respiration thirty seven 
finally the material separated from the substance of the organs in consequence of the nutritive movement are carried along by the blood and are afterwards separated and rejected from the system in the form of liquids or of vapours these acts which are in a measure the completion of the nutritive process bear the general names of exhalation and secretion thirty eight to recapitulate we see then that the functions of nutrition are constituted of several series of phenomena each having its seat in different organs and that these different acts are first digestion second absorption third circulation fourth simultaneous decomposition and recomposition of the organs of nutrition properly so called fifth respiration sixth exhalation and secretion end of lesson six